What's up guys, it's your favorite Cube Coach. Welcome back to another video. In this particular video, we're gonna be doing a deep dive analysis on David Ledbetter, the infamous David Ledbetter. So without further ado, let's go do this thing. If you guys are just tuning into this series, we're actually doing a four part video series where we take a look at Sean Foley, David Ledbetter, and Butch Harmon. And then in the last video, we're gonna kind of compare all of their theories and kind of figure out, hey, is there one better than the other? Can we even make that type of claim? So if you're interested in this, Let's get into David Ledbetter. So a lot of you guys probably don't know, but David Ledbetter did start out as a professional golfer. He played on the European and South African tours. However, it looks like he didn't have very much success. However, he was very much interested in swing mechanics, which if you talk to a lot of golf instructors, it's a very similar story. A lot of people who want to be professional golfers who just weren't quite good enough tended to start looking into mechanics because they're trying to figure out why they weren't quite good enough. And then ultimately it tends to lead him down the road of golf instruction. So right around the time when he was around 28 to about 35, I'm not quite sure of the exact age. However, he met Nick Faldo, And from there, he went on teaching Nick Faldo, who then won six major championships and became world number one in the world. And that's exactly what popularized David Ledbetter and really kind of spurred his career. Now, moving into the current day, David Ledbetter has taught players who have won 26 major championships as well as 150 individual tournaments throughout the whole world, which is pretty impressive. And if you go through his major champion list, he has Kathy Baker, Ian Baker Finch, Ernie Els, Nick Faldo, Trevor Immelin, Daniel King, Lydia Ko, Sayri Park, Suzanne Pedersen, Nick Price, Michelle Wee. Is a pretty star-studded list right there in terms of all the major champions and he's also taught a lot more professional golfers personally himself or from any of the instructors that he's certified they also teach quite a bit of professional golfers as well some other interesting highlights of david ledbetter is he's written eight books that have sold over two million copies which is ridiculous as well i've checked out his online website he has an online academy for instructors who he then teaches those instructors to either work at his golf academies or just get certified from him so they can kind of market themselves also he has an online Academy for you, the client out there as well, with a huge video library that has all the videos you could pretty potentially want to kind of work on your golf swing. He just partnered with uh, Golf Zone, which if you guys don't know Golf Zone in Japan, at least there's a bunch of them. It's an indoor facility where you can literally um, hit off mats that kind of move like this to simulate on the course. You can play uh, rounds of golf at your favorite golf courses that you know. It's a pretty um, unique facility that in Japan, at least, is incredibly popular. So he's got a lot going on with his business currently. Last, in terms of family, he's actually married himself and L. PGA Tour professional Kelly Ann I believe they have sons Andy and James and daughter Haley that they all live in Florida so looks like he's an all-around golf type of guy which personally I mean I'm kind of the same way I'm, my wife also is very much into golf and uh, my kid is also a little baby but I'm sure he's going to be very much into golf as well so very interesting on that fact let's go hop in now maybe to some negative sides of David Ledbetter now with all that success you're going to have people that are critical of you and David Ledbetter is no exception he has plenty of people that have been critical about him in the past specifically in this video I'm going to talk about an incident with Tiger Woods which I thought was really funny I'm also going to talk a little bit about Lydia Ko and Michelle Wee how a lot of people think that David Ledbetter ruined their those two players careers and then ultimately we're going to end up with the A swing and how he pivoted away from this traditional golf swing that he taught to Nick Faldo to now teaching this new modern swing which very interesting came at a time to where he might needed to have rebranded himself because he was losing a lot of popularity so it's interesting about that part as well so let's go talk about Tiger Woods so the Tiger story goes like this back in 1997 Tiger Woods burst out on the scene winning a couple PGA Tour tournaments and a lot of people were hyping him up however David Ledbetter apparently was not really a big fan of Tiger Woods and he made an infamous quote that goes as such basically Tiger Woods didn't have a chance of winning a major championship in the foreseeable future because Tiger Woods didn't know how to dial back his swing speed he didn't know how to hit the finesse shots that were needed to win a major championship so hence, Tiger Woods didn't have a chance to win a major championship in the foreseeable future. However, unfortunately for David Ledbetter, Tiger Woods went on to win two months later the Masters Championship, which I'm sure you guys all saw, the 1997 Masters Championship, and it was kind of a big middle finger to David Ledbetter. Now, moving into Lydia Ko and Michelle Wee, which are two great examples of players who could potentially have been a whole lot better if they had not gone to David Ledbetter. Now, at this time, David Ledbetter was primarily starting to teach the A-swing, and specifically with Lydia Ko, what we found was when she switched to the A-swing, we saw that she did not play anywhere near 
at the same level that she was playing before. Again, she was world number one. She was winning a bunch of tournaments, winning a bunch of major championships as a teenager, just completely dominating. However, once she started to work with David Ledbetter, we really just saw her play decrease quite significantly, as well as she kind of is now just an average LPGA Tour player. Obviously, she's a little bit probably better than average LPGA Tour player, but the argument goes she could have been maybe one of the best ladies to ever play on the LPGA Tour. But at this current time, it doesn't seem like she's going to have that type of potential anymore, just based off her current play. Now, the argument with Lydia Ko is what David Ledbetter is saying is that her parents are very much involved in the day to day with Lydia Ko, as well as they're really strict and harsh on her. So maybe that her parents kind of controlling her as much is really kind of hurting Lydia's play. But I'm sure when Lydia was a teenager, she was also getting that same type of control. So hopefully at this time, maybe she's used to it, or hopefully at this time she can kind of give the middle finger to her parents and say, hey, I made millions of dollars, go F off. I don't really know what the deal is. However, you can definitely see that the play is nowhere near as good as she was as a teenager. Now, Michelle Wee's story is gonna be very similar to Lydia Ko. However, there are some differences. The main criticism that Michelle Wee got back in the day was gonna be she played on the PGA Tour with the men when she should have been playing on the LPGA Tour with the women, with the competition that she's gonna be facing throughout her career. Now, personally, I don't feel like that there's anything wrong with what she did. I actually felt like, if anything, it probably helped her. More so where I felt like uh, Michelle Wee went wrong was just her lack of motivation with golf throughout her career. You can kind of see it as a young kid. She had all this talent. She had all the pressure in the world from not only just her parents, but also kind of from the golf industry. Everyone wanted her to be kind of the Tiger Woods of the LPGA Tour. And unfortunately for her, I felt like that put a lot of pressure on her as well as it really kind of demotivated her. And eventually what you kind of saw was really just she wasn't really motivated to play golf. You could just tell it by the way that she was playing on the courts. It looked like she was going through the motions. On top of that, she was going through all these swing changes with David Ledbetter. We saw a lot of her athleticism get uh, kind of shrunken down. Her swing got shorter. She started working on these things that necessarily weren't pertinent to what she had to work on. And eventually it just kind of all accumulated into a career that wasn't very impressive at all for all the hype that she had as a junior. Now let's take some time and pivot and talk about David Ledbetter's pivot to the A-swing, which is going to be this new modern way of swinging the golf club that he came up with to kind of rebrand himself and make him a little bit more fresh, a little bit new to the golf industry, because again, he was losing a little bit of popularity with all these other golf instructors popping up that had all these new modern theories. Again, I don't know if it was really just strictly business that he had to rebrand himself to kind of make himself popular again, or he just really did believe in these changes, or it could be accumulation a little bit of both. But what we're gonna do in this video is we're gonna take a look at a video of him explaining the A-swing backswing. I'm gonna give you guys some comments on the video. It's really interesting as well. There's some criticism I have of the A-swing and the way he teaches it as well. And it, it all starts really with the grip. It's a slightly different grip because convention, Conventionally, we say, okay, we'll get the hand parallel on, on, on the club here. And so what we're suggesting... Okay, to start this video off, it's going to be talking about the backswing with the A swings. Uh, particularly, he's going to start off with a different grip, and it's actually a lot different than what you see most people teaching. Now, he's talking about here in terms of parallel on the grip. He's talking about if the lead hand was in a fashion like this, which would be slightly strong. Typically, what you're going to see most people teach is the right hand is going to come under like this and kind of match it on the grip, or he calls it parallel. Now, what he teaches is he likes to see the lead hand slightly strong, maybe two to three knuckles, and then he wants to see the right hand on top of the grip like this. Now, in his personal opinion, if you can grip the club this way, he says it's going to make it a lot easier to get the club head from not moving inside on the takeaway section as well as opening up the face angle. Now, my personal opinion, I feel like, yes, it could be potentially easier. However, it doesn't necessarily correlate to the club head not moving in. And honestly, I really don't feel like it's that big of a deal, honestly, depending on kind of where you grip the club. You just have to have really good wrist conditions. And let me kind of explain. So if I take my lead hand and I move it like he wants it to move, which is right around two knuckles here, I put my right hand like this. What happens here is I still have a range of motion to move my wrist in this fashion. Now, because I have a range of motion to move my wrist in that fashion, if I can do that right around the takeaway section, you're gonna see that the club head is gonna get inside and the face angle is gonna be opening up. So again, hopefully I just kind of debunked that right there. Even if you get his grip, it doesn't necessarily make it easier for you to actually get the club moving in the right direction. Now from here, I'm gonna press play. We're gonna watch a little bit more. There's some interesting other parts about this backswing with the A-swing. That we never get the club head behind our hands. The, the big problem that we see with so many golfers and the, the great thing with the A-swing, it doesn't have to be perfect, it's an approach. It's not necessarily so much a method, it's like an organic approach where you- I definitely call it a method. Work on one or two little things and it improves the other things down the line. In other words, your impact position is gonna be improved. Your and by the way, for you golf instructors out there, I don't know why everyone nowadays is saying a method is a bad thing. 
I think having a method, especially when you're teaching a lot of just amateur golfers who don't have a lot of time to work on their golf swings, I think having a systemized approach is really good for those type of clients. Now, if you're gonna be teaching professional golfers who have all types of unique golf swings, obviously a method is not gonna work for them. However, methods aren't that bad, guys. You, got, you know, if it's for the right person, it's not a bad thing. So stop hating on the methods out there. This is gonna be improved, your balance is gonna improve. And so by having this grip, it allows us to take the club back in a way you can see that the club face looks at the ball. So there you go. So if you have this grip, it's gonna allow you to take the club back in a, or club back in a way to where you can actually get the club head outside the hands. And we just kind of debunk that. We can kind of go like this, the club head's gonna get behind the hands. I can have any type of grip and still keep the club head in front of the hands as long as you have proper wrist conditions. Now, if you're not so mobile, Certain grips might be more difficult to keep the club head in front of your hands. However, his grip doesn't necessarily make it easier than other grips. I mean, as you can see, as I swing it back here, I'm, I move my body. It's not like I just move my hands and my arms. We're always focusing on the word core, okay? We use the core, we move the abdominal area. And as I do this, you can see, look where the club head is. <coughs> I set the club in a way that's fairly steep. So this is what we're looking for. We're looking for this angle going. So again, that is another thing that is uh, probably different from the A swing. A lot of you guys are probably thinking about Matthew Wolf right now. What he was saying back then was he wanted to see the club shaft pretty steep. Anywhere from pretty much ball line to pointing halfway in between uh, ball line and the toe line, I think is kind of his parameters. However, for most people, that is a little bit on the steeper side, but nothing like too crazy. Um, no nothing like Matthew Wolf, who actually almost points the club head or sorry, the grip end almost at his heel line. Back. And then conventionally, or conversely, I should say, uh, it's, it's against convention. Convention says it should be here. But conversely, from here, as I move my body, the club actually shallows out onto the... And this is something I want to talk about because I find this incredibly false for a lot of my clients personally who do have a steeper club shaft on the backswing. Most of the time, you actually do see them get, if anything, even steeper on the downswing or at least maintain, which then in turn means they're going to be incredibly steep with the pitch of the club shaft. So I've seen a lot of instructors kind of roll this out lately. Hey, if you can get steep right here, automatically shells on the golf or on the downswing. And I'm sure a lot of you guys out there can also attest for your own game. So that probably doesn't necessarily happen, right? So that is something also I don't really like the wording that he's talking there. Like, it automatically does this he didn't really say automatically however he's kind of inferring that it automatically would do that i personally don't agree with that well very upright and steep we're not trying to get the arms up that's the thing that we don't want to we don't want to sort of confuse we want a fairly upright swing with the shaft but a fairly flat swing with the arm so you can see my arms all Okay, and this is another thing I'm not really a big fan of with this golf swing as well. So if you're gonna get a really vertical club shaft and then you're gonna get the lead arm really low below the shoulder line, what does that mean? Well, it means that your hands are not very far away from the golf ball, as opposed to a swing where the lead arm is on the shoulder line or above. Now, if the club shaft is gonna be a little bit more on a cross the line position at the top, kind of what he's almost teaching with that really steep club shaft at P3, that means that you need to have time to allow the club shaft to kind of get back onto a, let's call it a decent plane, so you can actually enter into the golf ball from a decent, decent position. So if you have a much shorter swing, it becomes much more difficult to do that. Hence, when you typically see people who have a cross the line club shot position who play on the tour, they tend to be the longer swingers out there on the tour. You don't see too many people have a really short swing besides maybe Matthew Wolf, who are getting really crossed at the top and being able to kind of play and function um, at a high level. So again, wrapping up on kind of his A swing in terms of the back swing, what we're seeing here is unconventional grip. That doesn't necessarily mean anything. Uh, we're also seeing that the uh, lead arm is going to be really low there. And then he's talking about the club shaft at position B3 being very steep. And then I'm sure there's some other stuff on the downswing, but I really don't care to kind of watch it. And personally, in my opinion, I'm not really too impressed with the A swing. I've seen other people explain a similar type of swing in a lot better way as well. So to wrap up David Ledbetter, definitely um, you can't hate on the guy too much. I mean, the amount of wins that he's gotten from his tour players and the amount of majors he's gotten from his tour players is incredibly impressive. The business that he's created is incredibly impressive. He's gotta be one of the most highest paid golf instructors in the world, most likely up there with Butch Harmon, maybe some other guys like that. So in those regards, yes, very, very impressive. And I'm sure when you teach, or if he teaches you one-on-one, -on -one, I'm sure he's a great golf instructor as well. However, in terms of the A swing method, not really a huge fan, but everything else, I guess I could say it's pretty good. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, share all that good stuff and I'll see you guys in the next video.